we don't always get all the culture that we want. 168 hours in the week. If we can't spend most of one hour on poetry. Oh, Haydn's here. All right. He's making his way to his seat. See, I can only lean in and look funny when, before the curtain goes up. Making my way to my seat. Did you have a reserved seat? Does, does Haydn have a reserved seat? Has he got a... Has he, did he purchase a season ticket? Sam Weiss! Sam Weiss is in the house. Sam, Sam, Sam. Got to tell you, happy to be... Happy to, that things are spreading out a little bit, you know? Our, 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 our key phrase is spread the words. So, Katrina Knight checking in. Hello, Katrina, down there in the Tri-Cities. Um, spread the words is our, you know, our little tagline. Finn Livingston. Whoops. Who's that guy? Uh, Finn Livingston also in the house. Oh, let's not get, let's just try to maintain some sense of decorum here. I don't. We don't want things to be exposed ahead of time. Sometimes I click on the wrong thing. Howdy doody, Janine Boggs. Howdy doody. Ah, check this out. Check it out, people. I don't even understand how it works. How does it work? I don't know. What do you know? Well, I know it's Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. The day that time forgot. Yes, friends, it's once again time for the poetry break. I am your poetry uh, evangelist. Thank you. Thank you. Dig deep! Um, I am an evangelist of poetry. I try to spread the words hither and thither about the planet uh, by whatever means I can. I've been going out and, and reading in front of people I don't know. I don't know. It's not the same as singing. It's not the same. It's not as full body. Maybe I just need to move more. You know? And I'll probably, then I'd probably pull something or dislocate something or something. You know? Fall and break a hip. He fell and broke his hip. How did he do that? He was reading poetry in front of people. Huh. What did he do that for? Well, he got some kind of wild hair. He wanted to read poetry in front of people. Make him stop, will you? Anyway, welcome everybody. Where are we at? We got twelve in the house. Hey, that's a that's beyond a, that's like two or three quorums from where I come from, the land of the uh, of the uh, intentionally obscure, the uh, land of the what the I don't know whatever you want to call it. Thanks, Ma. My mom's in the house. I've been looking at pictures of my mom today. I had this did this little thing up for All Hallows Eve. Some different pictures of my mom. That's her out on Fox Island. That's her with Dick Strep, the love of her life. This is she and I. She and I at the uh, release concert for uh, Night Sky, my last album. <laughs> and this one was taken about a week before she passed by my daughter, who's also featured. Some kind of an app that my daughter uses, where you take a picture of where you are, are and then you take a picture of yourself in that place. It's supposed to be some kind of currency for the for the young. I just sit over here and wonder why. Wonder why the world got like it got. It's okay. Yes, he was sweet, Janine Box. So I've been st I've been hanging around in this. Uh, it's been anthologies, man. I've been a couple of anthologies have been. Holding my attention this week. Together in Sudden Strangeness. I started last week with this. I know. But it's different poems tonight. It's not the same stuff over again. Okay? And uh, so I wanted to read a couple of these. One that's kind of not so pleasant. And the other one is actually gets the nose up on it. So we'll start with the less than pleasant. Not that I'm, you know. This is by Katha Pollitt. Katha, K-A-T-H-A. Pollitt, P-O-L-L-I-T-T, -T, two L's, two T's. Katha Pollitt. It's called Plague Poem. Perhaps it is best that we go away now, bundle up our tyrants, lies and balloons, our screams, long nights in front of TV with a beer and takeout, furtive ecstasies in hotel closets. We could leave 
We could just leave quietly, ignoring the ghosts of our fathers, striding through the mists in their clanking armor, babbling about justice and the glorious future. The swans and dolphins will not try to restrain us. A poet should praise the world. Good luck with that. I've stopped following the news. Perhaps when we are gone, the mythological animals, dragons and griffins, the beautiful lonely phoenix will come out of hiding and loll on the empty benches in the park that shimmers feverishly below my window. Plague poem by Katha Pollitt. Katha Pollitt. Let's try it again. Perhaps it is best that we go away now, bundle up our tyrants, lies and balloons, our screams, long nights in front of TV with a beer and takeout, furtive ecstasies in hotel closets. We could just leave quietly, ignoring the ghosts of our fathers, striding through the mists in their clanking armor, babbling about justice and the glorious future. The swans and dolphins will not try to restrain us. A poet should praise the world. Good luck with that. I've stopped following the news. Perhaps when we are gone, the mythological animals, dragons and griffins, the beautiful lonely phoenix, will come out of hiding and loll on the empty benches in the park that shimmers feverishly below my window. Katha Pollitt. Another poet I've never heard. Isn't it amazing how many poets we've never heard of? Some of you may have heard of Katha Pollitt. Maybe Bridget. Bridget is a student of what's happening now in poetry. Cindy Snyder's in the house. Lori Trout. Lori Trout. Happy Tuesday to you, Lori. Happy Tuesday. Not Jägermeister, but, you know, what are you going to do? Any port in a storm. Smooth. <sighs> Katha Pollitt. Okay. Now we're going to hear one from Kitty O'Meara. Kitty O'Meara. New to me. New to me. It's called And the People Stayed at Home. This is the one where we get the nose up. Okay. All right. I bet we're ready for that. And the People Stayed at Home by Kitty O'Meara. And the people stayed home, and they listened, and read books, and rested, and exercised, and made art, played games, and learned new ways of being, and were still. And they listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced. Some met their shadows, and the people began to think differently. And the people healed. And... In the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. Now that's a, that's a prophecy I can live with. And the people stayed home. But they didn't stay staying home, is the thing. That's kind of the what I've been thinking about, and I bet a lot of you have been thinking about it too. All that stuff we thought during the pandemic, those were real thoughts, right? Those were real things that we were thinking about how things could and should be different, you know? I don't know. More humanity, I think. Kitty O'Meara is the poet, and the people stayed home is the name of the poem. And the people stayed home, and they listened, and read books, and rested, and exercised, and made art, and played games, and learned new ways of being, and were still. And they listened more deeply, some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows, and the people began to think differently. And the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. 
And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. A couple of more from Together in Sudden Strangeness, which is a unique anthology from a unique time that was not in any way... Uh, I mean, it was real. It really happened. It was real time. We all passed through it. We should hold some of that stuff. I'm thinking. I'm thinking we should hold some of that stuff. Where am I going here? Next up. It's been a fun week. I got to tell you, it's been a quiet week in old manhood. Okay? I've written every day. It's all crap. It's all crap. Sorry. Sorry, it's crap. It was a crap week in old manhood. What can I say? Except that, you know, if I thought it had any redeeming quality, you know I would read it. <laughs> you know I would. You know, I'll read pretty much anything that I come up with, thinking that well, maybe they'll like it. But no. If I don't like it, if, if it doesn't ring a bell for me, I won't subject you to it. You'll find it in the uh, the uncollected poems of Bill Davy after I'm, after I'm long gone. But Mark Kenny was not quiet. He was not just thinking around. Uh, he, he was thinking poetry. He wrote in, he said, Rilke poem and, some, and something else. You know that I'm a fan of Rilke, and of all the poetry I fall back on, there is always one that catches me. And I can see why this one caught you, Mark. And I don't know if you were thinking about Diane, but I certainly was thinking about Diane when I read this one. It's called Let This Darkness Be a Bell Tower by Rainer Maria Rilke. Quiet friend who has come so far, feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. As you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. Move back and forth into the change. What is it like, such intensity of pain? If the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses, the meaning discovered there. And if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow. To the rushing water speak, I am. Huh? Let this darkness be a bell tower. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for thinking of this one. Because the hand, when I think about the hand, I think about, uh, I think, of, it, it, it's the hand, ladies and The hand, the hand is, hello, hand. Oh, look, she's brought the chain. It's a little dinky chain now. Little dinky chain. What, do you want me to hold it? So that means there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six left. There you go. There you go. Once more. I just want to. The hand. The hand, the hand came by to, to uh, tear another link off the chain. So six more radiation treatments. So. Uh, a week from tomorrow, she'll be done. We'll get to ring the bell. I guess they get this bell that you get to ring after your last treatment, either chemo or, or radiation. So, Did I read this twice? I'm going to read it a third time if I did. Let this darkness be a bell tower by Rilke. Quiet friend who has come so far, feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower, and you the bell. As you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. Move back and forth into the change. What is it like, such intensity of pain? If the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. In this uncountable, uncontainable night, in this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses, the meaning discovered there. 
And if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow. To the rushing water, speak, I am. There you go. Mark Kenny sent that in. Little Rilke. Little Rilke. Now we're cooking, huh? Now we're cooking. What do we got down there? Carrie Brakefield Kearns is back. Hey, Rochelle Hamill's back. Jamie Turner. Yes. Loving it. Loving it. Holly Tuttle is here. So the full complement of Wranglers from the Lame Cat Ranch are, are here. I don't know how many cats that includes. Maybe we could get a count of the cats just so that I won't have to be thinking about that. All huh? Couldn't we do that? Okay. So here's what else Mark said. Mark Kenny. I haven't been penning much poetry as my word reserves were robbed by November's maniacal novel writing madness. Yeah, he was part of that. But here is something that welled up within me today as I am deep into creating a family history album book of life for my wider clan, knowing that the days remaining are far less than what I have been privileged to live. I had trepidations using the keynote phrase and title as it's a direct reference from J.R.R. Tolkien, as well as a noted Christian hymn. But that was the springboard into what followed. I think there's more, but I lose patience with myself so quickly these days. It's best I lay down what I can when I can, while I still can. I hear you there, buddy. I hear you. Long have I wandered, it's called. Long have I wandered. Long have I wandered, wide is the way. I have learned much, but forgotten more. My days are short, night advances even quicker. A somber nocturne, restlessness and regret, tinged with abject longing for kith and kin, for home and hearth and healing. Long have I wandered, wide is the way. I have learned much, but forgotten more. Precious to me are the stories I carry, upwellings deep in memory, steeped in equal measure by bliss and horror, by honor and sacrifice, love tempered by loss, forged in friendship's ever fine embrace. Long have I wandered, wide is the way. I have learned much, but forgotten more. So much more. There you go, Mark Kenny. Long have I wandered, it's called. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Long have I wandered. Long have I wandered. Wide is the way. I have learned much, but forgotten more. My days are short. Night advances even quicker. A somber nocturne, restlessness and regret, tinged with abject longing for kith and kin, for home and hearth and healing. Long have I wandered, wide is the way. I have learned much, but forgotten more. Precious to me are the stories I carry, upwellings deep in memory, steeped in equal measure by bliss and horror, by honor and sacrifice, love tempered by loss, forged in friendships ever fine in grace. Embrace. Long have I wandered, wide is the way. I have learned much, but forgotten more. So much more. Peace to you and Diane over the next weeks, and we wish that however you celebrate the holidays, the days are filled with love and laughter. Well, Mark, you needn't worry about that one. That little piece is, I would say, well in hand. Yeah. We laugh as much as we can, and uh, we do the other thing, too. My old friend Gene Burnett from down in Ashland, Oregon, who does a weekly thing himself. He posts it Sunday nights at 8 p.m., Pacific time on his Facebook page, Gene Burnett, G E N E B U R N E T T, one N two T's, and Gene Burnett. And uh, he sings a few songs, and then he has this long line of 
there's a bunch of stuff that he's re-listening to. He's been listening to all of my recordings, uh, starting from the beginning and working up to the present. Although there is nothing from the present, 2019 was my last uh, my last deposit, shall we say. Um, but anyway, and he's also listening to a bunch of Jim Page. He's listening to all kinds of different stuff. And you can post stuff that you are listening to. And so he encourages that. It's a, supposed to be a conversation in song. And I love it. I love it. I wish I had more time to participate, but I, I try to get in there and say thanks for the nice things he says about me. Here's what Gene wrote. Here's one you might take a crack at. It's the lyrics from a sh sort of surreal but autobiographical song I wrote back in 09. Not factual, but not untrue. I read it at a poet at poetry slams a few times back in the sl in the sl me slamming days. I'm not a big slammer. In the song, the one line chorus is sung twice, but when I did it at slams, I shortened it to one, which I think is good. I mean, there are five of the suckers. And I also used to put the word C in front of most of the choruses, unlike in the song, but I don't like that anymore. I like it better just going in straight. So this is the version below. Okay. He also included a word doc, which I guess uh, had a different, slightly different set of lyrics. Anyway, the song is called Fated, Fated, F-A-T-E-D, by Gene Burnett, 2009. I was raised in Arizona, just outside of Boston, in the heart of the great Northwest. My brother was a crocodile, my sister was an only child, and I was always looking for a nest. Flights of arrows after school, all that freedom, all those rules. They missed me, but they got me in the knees. Nothing meant a thing except for everything, and everything was all the same. To me. It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate. I, stared, I stayed where I was born and traveled around the world in a boat that never left the rails. I was famously unknown, a soprano's baritone, and all I learned to do was sort the mail. Typecast as an outcast, I tried to blend right in, but Everybody knew who wasn't me. Walking in the park, I met a school of sharks who dried me out and tossed me in the sea. It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate. Washed up, washed up on the other coast, I met a boy who talked with ghosts and asked him could he spare a little change. He said change comes from within. I'll trade you my gold for half your tin, if you will act your shoe size, not your age. Under wing and over time, on a roll and on dime, what I didn't learn I didn't need. I skipped the shortcut, took the long, found out where the weak are strong, and where between the two to look for me. It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate. I wasn't down or up for grabs. I fell in with another crab and started combing beaches all the time. Trading shells for wedding bells, all my shows for all her tells, and I began to sink into the climb. Will the tide go up or down? Will I drown or will I drown? Where will I arrive before I leave? Every problem, every mess turned into another yes, because yes is what I had a mind to see. It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate. I died and took a walk where angels fear to tread and found the fellowship of fools was not so bad. We all have our ways of getting through the, through the maze when even scientists are going mad. Choose your poison. Choose your view. Choose your weapon. It chose you. Find a way to find a little peace. Check your baggage. Check your ego. Check the pilot. Where did he go? Buckle up and say a prayer for me. 
It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate. Gene, get out of town with that, my friend. Whew. Whew. Yeah, I think you got all of that one. Just the right amount of, of zaniness and confusion mixed with some real, some real what? What? Some real truths. Yeah. To Gene Burnett. Lori Trout, commemorative shot number two, sending it down to Gene, because he's not only sending poetry to the poetry break, he's doing a weekly thing himself that is well worth attending to. Check it out. I think you'll get involved. You'll get kind of drawn into it when you start posting favorite songs of yours, and then you're off to the races, baby. Gene Burnett. If you want to hear his music, just go to GeneBurnett.com. G-E-N-E-B-U-R-N-E-T-T dot C-O-M. That'll get you there. His whole site is free. He does have a tip basket, so you can uh, contribute to the well-being and upkeep of Gene and Samara and uh, their little piece of paradise down in Ashland, Oregon. Gene, I salute you, sir. Fated is the name of the song that I'm going to read to you. I was raised in Arizona, just outside of Boston, in the heart of the great Northwest. My brother was a crocodile, my sister was an only child, and I was always looking for a nest. Flights of arrows after school, all that freedom, all those rules. They missed me, they missed me, but they got me in the knees. Nothing meant a thing except for everything, and everything was all the same to me. It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate. I stayed where I was born and traveled around the world in a boat that never left the rails. I was famously unknown, a soprano's baritone, and all I learned to do was sort the mail. Typecast as an outcast, I tried to blend right in, but everybody knew who wasn't me. Walking in the park, I met a school of sharks who dried me out and tossed me in the sea. It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate. Washed up on another coast, I met a boy who talked with ghosts, and I asked him, could he spare a little change? He said, change comes from within. I'll trade my gold for half your, my gold for half your tin, if you will act your shoe size, not your age. Under wing and over time, on a roll and on a dime. But I didn't learn... I didn't need. I skipped the shortcut, took the long, found out where the weak were strong, and where between the two to look for me. It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate. I wasn't down or up for grabs. I fell in with another crab and started combing beaches all the time. Trading shells for wedding bells, all my shows for all her tells, and I began to sink into the climb. Will the tide go up or down? Will I drown or will I drown? Where will I arrive before I leave? Every problem, every mess turned into another yes, because yes was what I had a mind to see. It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate. I died and took a walk where angels fear to tread and found the fellowship of fools was not so bad. We all have our ways of getting through the maze when even scientists are going mad. Choose your poison. Choose your view. Choose your weapon. It chose you. Find a way to find a little peace. Check your baggage. Check your ego. Check the pilot. Where did he go? Buckle up and say a prayer for me. It's my fate to have free will. It's my will to trust in fate.
you see, what I'm saying is there's enough interesting stuff going on just live streaming now. You don't need to watch the big networks. Man, it's happening. It's happening. Gene Burnett is, a, is, a, is one spoke in the wheel of something new that's turning. Jim Page, he does live streams. I'm hoping that he's starting to do them every week, but he's done them for the last few Sundays. That's Sundays, 1 p.m. Pacific time on Jim Page's Facebook page. Yeah. Speaking of pages, Nils Peterson. Nils Peterson, maybe the most famous poet that I'm personally acquainted with, uh, sent out his weekly email. He actually posted a poem on his Facebook page, and I saw it and I read it and I was like, oh, that's perfect. A nice little holiday poem, and I didn't have, I just stumbled upon it. Yes, this is the kind of holiday poem I want to read. So I, I said on his Facebook page, I said, Nils, I hope you don't mind that I snag this for the poetry break. And he said, no problem. And then he sent another email that includes the poem, but with some uh, notebook stuff to introduce it. And there's nobody like Nils Peterson for setting up one of his own poems or someone else's uh, with uh, recollection or an exercise in recollection, which is this is about. It's called On Your Way, An Exercise in Remembering. This is from an old notebook. Blessed be my old notebooks. The way we walk through our memories like strangers in a forgotten town. That's a quote. The way we walk through our memories like strangers in a forgotten town. For me, the town is not so much forgotten, more like lived in so long ago that I can't remember which way to turn to go where I think I'd like to go. So I'm stuck where I am. The quotation is from an article about James Salter in the New York Times travel section, 6 10 2018. Having written that, I tried to visualize walking down the stairs from the chauffeur's flat, which was my first home, and out of the door, and yes, I can see across the graveled path the old apple tree, so bent its trunk had to be propped up, on the left of the greenhouse, with its tool shed, further left down the path, the stuccoed building which housed the squash court, and on the right, the enormous lawn, which held the fenced, clay-surfaced tennis court. I tried walking down the long driveway, shielded on the right by a line of fir trees, and out to the street. Now, memory becomes uncertain. I will try to walk around some more later. I'm 90 now. I would have been eight the last time I could have physically done this. So Nils at 90 is remembering Nils at eight years old. So you try to remember what happened 82 years ago. I can't, not unless I look it up. Yeah. I tried this again this morning and got farther. I turned right, remembered there was no sidewalk, but there was another line of tall trees meant to shield a large house from the street. I cross the street to sidewalk. There's just a house or two before I get to Hillside Avenue. They're on higher ground than the sidewalk and hedged. I cross Hillside Avenue and turn left, passing two or three big houses, which I really can't see in my memory until I come to the next street where I can almost see the big house on the corner because it was an enormous lot and lower than my street, and I looked down on it every day as I passed before turning right on my way to school. When snow came, this was the street we used for sleigh riding. I can't remember its name, though I can remember the names of the two parallel streets on either side, Waktung and Evergreen. Waktung, that's W-A-T-C-H-U-N-G, Watchtung. Watchtung? Watchung. Watchung and evergreen. And yes, I know, memory is a co-creator, not a keeper of index cards, but I believe it also is like a muscle which grows stronger with use. 
you might try the same exercise. That is, go out the door of your first home and take a walk. What do you see? If imagination tries to help, there's nothing to do but allow it. A Christmas P.S. Remembering walking down the stairs of the chauffeur's cottage that began this exercise, I share this. And here's the poem that he posted. Now, Nils, if you didn't pick up on that, Nils' dad was a chauffeur to a obviously more wealthy family. So Nils spent his first eight years in chauffeur's uh, digs on a larger, shall we say, estate? Shall we say property? Yeah. So, the poem is called This Wonder. This Wonder. Christmas morning. I wake early to a strange noise from below, and in my footed pajamas, holding on to the railing, I creep down the shadowy stairs leading from the chauffeur's flat to the workroom below. Of all things, there's my father bending over an electric train whizzing round and round an oval track nailed to a piece of plywood. He doesn't see me, but I watch him, caught as he is in the mystery of train lights, ruby and white, circling in the half-darkness. For a while I don't make a sound, but watch him, wondering about his strange smile. All these years later, I tiptoe down the stairs again, now understanding the poverty of his childhood and the jobless years of the Depression, and I watch him and imagine him thinking, I am able to give to my children for Christmas this wonder. Huh? Huh? Nils. Nils Peterson. He's a Seattle guy now, folks. He's a Seattle guy now. Yes. Shot numero trace to Nils Peterson, an elder statesman. Maybe the only oldest person here. I don't know. I don't even know if he's here. John Gorski's here, though. And Bridget. Cindy Clark is here. Cindy Clark. Bridget Lacey. And Nils Peterson. This wonder, it's called. I won't read the whole email thing again, but if you write to Nils Peterson, you can get on his email list. You can go to his Facebook page, N-I-L-S Peterson, like it's spelled, S-O-N. Uh, go to his Facebook page, hit him up, message him, say, hey, Nils, I'd love to be on your email list. He sometimes sends out three emails a week with something interesting, some little tidbit, something he's found or dug up or some new thing that he's thought. It's great. It's great to feel like you're in touch with an elder who has wisdom to impart. Yeah. Elders need a little more... Uh, little more credit for the wisdom that they have to impart, even if nobody wants to hear it. <laughs> there you go. This wonder. Christmas morning. I wake early to a strange noise from below and in my footed pajamas, holding onto the railing, I creep down the shadowy stairs leading from the chauffeur's flat to the workroom below. Of all things, there's my father bending over an electric train, whizzing around and round an oval track nailed to a piece of plywood. A piece of plywood. He doesn't see me, but I watch him, caught as he is in the mystery of train lights, ruby and white, circling in the half-darkness. For a while, I don't make a sound, but watch him wondering about his strange smile. All these years later, I tiptoed down the stairs again, now understanding 
the poverty of his childhood, and the jobless years of the Depression, and I watch him and imagine him thinking, I am able to give to my children for Christmas this wonder. Yeah. I remember the first, for me it wasn't electric trains, although my father still had his electric train set from when he was a kid, and it was perfectly maintained, still worked, still ran. The little transformer, you know, that you used to run those things with, the transformer, the original transformer still worked. It was a different era. The job wasn't to trash your toys like I always did. I don't think I ever trashed my dad's train set. But I made quick work of his tinker toys. I made... Uh, quick work of his erector set, although the little engine that you could use to make something that moved on the erector set still worked. It was a wind-up engine with a little switch on it. You could turn it on and it would... It was amazing. Amazing the number of toys I inherited from my dad. Anyway, including his Gene Autry uh, cap pistols. That's right. Hayden Reese. Are you still here, or have I been jabbering so long you had to leave? John Bundy's in the house. Hey, hey, John. How you doing? John Gorski. John. Didn't hear from John Gorski this week, but he's giving us, he, he's, John's smart. He doesn't want to overload us. He doesn't want to send something every, every week, because at some point I will have to disappoint him. Yeah. Cindy Clark. Cindy, thank you so much for your support. J.W. McClure. J.W., I miss you, man. Yes, I miss you. I miss your stories. I miss your method. you got a great method. Hide and Reese, though, sent in something. J.W., poetrybreak22 at gmail.com. Just send in some lyrics. Tell us a little bit about it. Come on. Hayden said this. I should be in the house tomorrow, but may arrive late. If you choose to read, do, do so with, when, to do, if you choose to read, do so when best for the show. The show. I guess this is a show, isn't it? On the new network. When we were kids, when I was a kid, I would never would have thought I would have my own access point to a mass audience. That's why we got to spread the words, people. We got to spread the words, not because I need a mass audience, but because poetry has uh, corrective powers, has healing powers. You can say that if you want to be all frou-frou and nuts and twigs about it, but it's got uh, therapeutic value in a time like the one we're in. Anyway, that's all. Hayden Reese sent a poem that he wrote called Now and Then. Hayden. It's like it could have it, it could have been a piece of old manhood. I, I assume that many of my friends who who happen to be male uh, will be writing something that could be part of old manhood because it's what we're all participating in now. And you young people out there, if there's one or two of you, you will participate in it too. So this is just a little foreshadowing of what is to come. It'll come before you're ready, sooner than you think it should have. And if you get all resentment about it, well, then you're lost. Here's how you should be. Now and Then by Hayden Reese. Behind these old eyes, a young man looks out at the world, surveying what age has delivered him. It is as he always remembered, yet some things have changed. Ah, the world is getting old, he thinks, and doesn't want to admit it. The mirror tells the same thing about himself. His face, with its familiar features bruised by 10,000 days under the sun, he still finds beautiful. Surely this is how it goes? Inside, he knows he draws closer to eternity. 
Not an end, but an endless beginning. I think it's just getting started, said the old poet last night. And that is for TM, whoever TM is. Wow. I would love to have a Haydn Reese poem written about me. I'm not, I'm not that needy, but sure I am. Who of us isn't that needy sometimes? It'd be nice to have one of these kind of over there in the corner so that if you ever are in a place, you can pull it out and say, yeah, yeah, this was written for me for when I was in this kind of a place. I'm getting a little weird, aren't I? Now and Then by Haydn Reese. Thank you, Haydn. Behind these old eyes, a young man looks out at the world, surveying what age has delivered him. It is as he always remembered, yet some things have changed. Ah, the world is getting old, he thinks, and doesn't want to admit it. The mirror tells the same thing about himself. His face, with its familiar features, bruised by 10,000 days under the sun, he still finds beautiful. Surely this is how it goes? Inside he knows he draws closer to eternity. Not an end, but an endless beginning. I think it's just getting started said the old poet last night. Haydn Reese, now and then. Holy smazoli. Have we got some creative people involved in this endeavor? I mean, so here's what this means. Here's what I think this means. Any of us who are writing anything should send some of that in here. It's going back to what we were hearing in this first anthology about the, you know, and people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, heartless ways, the earth began to heal. Share what has, uh, what has been part of your healing during or since the pandemic. Right? That's... That's what we can do from here forward. And don't forget to CC Nowville. Poetry Break 22 at gmail.com with your offerings of, of wonder, your little bits of fluff and flotsam and jetsam. Okay. Another uh, anthology that I found. I don't think anybody recommended it. I think I just like the sound of it. Poetry of Presence. An anthology of mindfulness poems. I thought, how can I go wrong? If I want to bring the nose up on any, any poetry break that I happen to be in the midst of, I can, I can pull this baby out. And, you know, get that, get that uplift I want towards the end. Where are we in? 747 coming out of the sky. Won't you take me down to Memphis on a midnight ride? I want to move. Plane and travel, man. Yeah. I've been flying across the land, trying to get a hand. Playing and traveling man. Okay, from Poetry of Presence, a poem called In the Middle, Barbara Crooker. Barbara Crooker. Barbara, like you'd expect it. Crooker, like you'd expect it. C-R-O-O-K-E-R. -O -O -E Barbara Crooker. In the middle. In the middle of a life that's as complicated as everyone else's. Struggling for balance. Juggling time. The mantle clock that was my grandfather's has stopped at 920 We haven't had time to get it repaired. The brass pendulum is still. The chimers don't ring. One day, I look out the window. Green summer. The next, the leaves have already fallen, and a gray sky lowers the horizon. 
Our children almost grown, our parents gone. It happens so fast. Each day we must learn again how to love between morning's quick coffee and evening's slow return. Steam from a pot of soup rises, mixing with the yeasty smell of baking bread. Our bodies twine, and the big black dog pushes his great head between, his tail a metronome, three-quarter time. We'll never get there. Time is always ahead of us, running down the beach, urging us on faster faster, but sometimes we take off our watches. Sometimes we lie in the hammock, caught between the mesh of rope and the net of stars, suspended, tangled up in love, running out of time. That gets, yeah, it gets all kind of Steven Spielberg, you know, special effects. Yeah, kind of effortless. It just slides into it because Steve is good at that. Have we got time for the poetry blues? I don't think so, people. Where are we at? That's 7.50. Okay. So I'm going to read this one and one more, okay? And then I'll let you go. In the Middle by Barbara Crooker, another poet we've never read from on the poetry break, so somebody to investigate. All you got to do is go onto the interwebs and Google Barbara Crooker, K C C R O O K E R. in the middle of a life that's as complicated as everyone else's, struggling for balance, juggling time. The mantle clock that was my grandfather's has stopped at 9.20. We haven't had time to get it repaired. The brass pendulum is still. The chimes don't ring. One day I look out the window, green summer. The next, the leaves have already fallen, and a gray sky lowers the horizon. Our children almost grown, our parents gone. It happens so fast. Each day we must learn again how to love between morning's quick coffee and evening's slow return. Steam from a pot of soup rises, mixing with the yeasty smell of baking bread. Our bodies twine, and the big black dog pushes the great head be pushes his great head between, his tail a metronome three quarter time. We'll never get there. Time is always ahead of us, running down the beach, urging us on faster, faster. But sometimes we take off our watches. Sometimes we lie in the hammock, caught between the mesh of rope and the net of stars, suspended, tangled up in love, running out of time. In the middle. By Barbara Crooker is the name. We're going to end tonight. We're going to wrap it all up with a little William Stafford. You may have heard that name a time or two. William Stafford vis visited my English class in high school at Stadium High School. Bud Cairns, uh, the father of Scott Cairns, who is a well-known poet. Uh, Bud Cairns was my high school English teacher. Uh, let's see. William Stafford, Mike McGee, and Scott Cairns were guest readers in our, uh, I think it was the Advanced Placement English class, but it was by basically English for people who thought they were smarter than they are. It was like English for dummies, but it was writing. It was writing for dummies. It was, try this out. Write what you want. Write about this, write about that, however you want to write, as a piece of fiction as a little uh, whatever, or as a poem, right about this. It was just cool. I loved it. I had Bud Cairns two or three, probably three, maybe four times. I think I TA'd. No, I'm not sure. I get high school mixed up with college because I had seminal, remembered, and 
vital English teachers both places. Bud Cairns at Stadium High School, Phil Eaton at Whitworth College, although Bill Woolham and Leonard Oakland were also there. Uh, yeah, Bud Cairns was the first one, first teacher I had who let me know, who gave me a sense that there might be a place for me as a writer in the world. Now, my dad was a, was a magazine cartoonist who dreamed of having a daily strip on the funny pages, on the comics page of the newspaper. Guys like Charles Schultz and, uh, and Bret Hart and Johnny Walker and Johnny, Johnny Hart, sorry, Brent Walker, Johnny Hart. Uh, these guys were making bank in those days just for having their funnies in the funny papers. Anyway, William Stafford was part of that world now, uh, then, and forever. Afterwards, this is called. Afterwards. Mostly you look back and say, well, okay, things might have been different, sure. And it's too bad, but look, things happen like that, and you did what you could. You go back and pick up the pieces. There's tomorrow. There's that long bend in the river on the way home. Fluffy bursts of milkweed are floating through shafts of sunlight or disappearing where trees reach out from their deep, dark roots. Maybe people have to go in and out of shadows till they learn that floating that immensity waiting to receive whatever arrives with trust. Maybe somebody has to explore what happens when one of us wanders over near the edge and falls for a while. Maybe it was your turn. Maybe it was your turn, as if it was already understood that it was you. Afterwards, William Stafford, this is a master. So everything that we've read up to this point leads up to this guy knew it. This guy knew what he was doing. Afterwards, mostly you look back and say, well, okay, things might have been different, sure. And it's too bad, but look, things happen like that. And you did what you could. You go back and pick up the pieces. There's tomorrow. There's that long bend in the river on the way home. Fluffy bursts of milkweed are floating through shafts of sunlight or disappearing where trees reach out from their deep, dark roots. Maybe people have Maybe people have to go in and out of shadows till they learn that floating, that immensity waiting to receive whatever arrives with trust, maybe somebody has to explore what happens when one of us wanders over near the edge and falls for a while. Maybe it was your turn. I tried to read it the two different ways. But that's... That is so easy to read. I, mean, I think that's the difference. Well, I don't even know. These, everybody that I've read tonight is good. I, I keep thinking that I have some insight into uh, what's the difference between a good poet and a great poet. I don't know Dinkus. As Diane will tell you if you ask her, I don't know Dinkus about this stuff. Yeah. So, Ma, I'm glad you were here. And the rest of you, too. Thank you for joining in. Are we going to do this next week? What is next week? Oh, that's not going to work. Let's try these glasses. Let's put on the long glasses. Yes! Next week is December the 19th. I say, why not? Here's what I will say. You see the, you see the email address here, right? Poetrybreak22 at gmail.com. How difficult is it to send one email this week? 168 hours you've got. One email. Send a favorite Christmas poem 
to poetrybreak22 at gmail.com. That way, next week, which will be our last poetry break before the holiday, our next meeting after that is on Boxing Day. Send your holiday poems, your Christmas poems, this week, right now. You were thinking about it already. I know you were. There's that one you remember from when you were a kid. You think, oh, it's doinky. Nobody else is going to like it. Are you kidding me? Those are the most, those are the ones that people like the most. Are you getting this? People like that old stuff that they remember from when they were kids. Okay? I'm just telling you. And we'll be here. We'll do this. Diane and I are having a quiet Christmas this year because, well, we're both kind of laid up, but most especially she is going through something right now that she's never been through before. And uh, I'm just hanging around, sucking up whatever fairy dust is left to keep me going. Yeah, There's plenty of fairy dust. Trust me, I got everything I need right here. And uh, I had some help from my favorite doctor in the world, Dr. Center. Thank you. And I get to see my physical therapist next week, Suzanne. Thank you. These are the people that keep the things from compacting. It's it's like you you feel like you've gone through a trash compactor, right? They're taking everything and just kind of... Until there's just no more. Okay. Let it go. But then you're like that. You're like that. You used to be like this. Now you're like this. You go. They do some things. They use the magic fingers, the positive touch, if you will, and they make it better. Thanks to those people. Because they are helping me a lot. And so that I can help Diane as much as I want to. Thanks, you guys, for being here to hold me up. As always, take care of each other. Here's to a poetic week for each and every one of us, okay? All right.